welcome to the ASCI Getting Real with Engineering webinar. This is our first webinar in the series uh, that ASCI is sponsoring. And uh, today, for those who are new to ASCI or are non-members joining as guests, uh, let me introduce uh, ASCI briefly. The American Society of Engineers of Indian Origin is a um, 34 year old organization with a mission to foster science and technology temper and create a community of like minded engineers and scientists amongst the Indian diaspora settled in the US. Uh, with five active chapters who aspire to organize events in their local geography. I represent the nation Silicon Valley chapter, where for the last few years since inception, we have focused on STEM and give back to the K-12 uh, education and underprivileged in the community. Hi, my name is Piyush Malik, and after two decades of corporate career in management consulting with PricewaterhouseCoopers and IBM, I'm now part of the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem and currently look after strategic accounts and Google Business Unit at SpringML, a startup helping enterprises take their first steps with data analytics and artificial intelligence and emerging technologies in their journey towards a digital transformation. Uh, today's topic of conversation is uh, totally out of the world. Many of you on the phone may have uh, on the line here would have uh, some experience with uh, rocket science or um, engineering, uh, but here uh, we are literally talking about space, moon and Mars and what space economy has in store for us. Our star speaker today is Dr. Ajay Kothari. To the ACI community, Dr. Kothari is uh, uh, not a new person, but for those who don't know, uh, he's the president and founder of Estrox Corporation, an aerospace R&D company located in Washington, DC area. His PhD and master's in science um, in aerospace engineering are from University of Maryland. He has over 40 publications in peer reviewed journals and very prestigious conferences. He was a, um, a best stu uh, student awardee and merit scholar holder from India, national merit scholar. And he was also awarded engineer of the year by ASCI in uh, 2011. And he served as the ASCI national chap Capital Chapter Chair uh, from 2014 to 15, and also uh, been on the national board here. And uh, uh, obviously, he has a lot of affiliations with the professional associations in aeronautics and space. And uh, there are a number of things that he has done in his life which qualify him to be the speaker here. So, uh, without much further ado, uh, let me welcome Dr. Katari. Oh, thank you very much, um, um, Piyush, and everybody on the uh, listening to this thing. And I'm very happy to be here. Um, is the video on, or is this just a? Um, uh, can... It's just, uh, it's oh, on. Okay. Video is on. Okay, yeah. I cannot see the video. Uh, we are sharing the screen right now, so this is what is uh, on. Uh, why don't we uh, get started uh, with uh, uh, you telling the listeners a little bit about your beginnings and how you got interested in space and what did you do to get here? Okay, uh, so um, <clears throat> um, it's a sort of a far out story also. Um, I, I was sitting in, my father had farm in uh, North Gujarat actually in India and I was, we were all sitting on the farm and we were, uh, we didn't have television. We didn't have enough money to buy a television or anything, but we had an old decrepit radio. We were trying to listen to the Mercury splash down and Apollo splash down. At that time, it was Mercury splash down. Um, uh, and then later on, Apollo splash down. Right in the middle of a jungle with, you know, with some tiger living nearby. And um, uh, it's just, it was just, very very interesting uh and we were trying to listen to this and um, um it was a successful thing after coming back from you know going around the moon and was not that not landed yet going around this this is in the 60s um going around the moon coming back and landing within three mile radius of the intended target so we were so impressed 
with the uh, United States, actually, and what uh, U.S. was able to do. I mean, the Russians also did that, but, you know, actually, not, not to take something away from them, but they would uh, announce it after the fact and in the uh, United States. So I was really got, I got very much interested and impressed by, uh, by what was happening here at that time and, you know, got interested and came here and did my bachelor's in physics and a master's and PhD in aerospace engineering from University of Maryland here uh, nearby in Washington, D.C. Suburb. So that's what, you know, got me interested. I'm still very much interested, as you can see, uh, in this uh, particular topic. And it's, you know, it's picking up uh, more and more um, uh, it, 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 you know, recently. So I wanted to sort of talk about that also. So that's kind of the story of yours. Great, great, Dr. Tari. Now, you know, we all have grown up, uh, some of us were born a bit later, but then uh, in 1950s, when the original space race started between US, SR, uh, yeah. and US, yeah. uh, you know, with the sending of Sputnik and uh, the race, who gets the first man on space, first man on moon, and so on and so forth, and uh, the presidential resolve of the country to send man on moon, um, you know, that was, that was in the days of John F. Kennedy. So yeah. starting from that space race to now, um, mm -hmm. uh, now there's a recent spurt of activities, obviously, right. in, uh, from various governments, uh, whether it is China, or whether it is uh, Israel, or whether it is uh, even uh, India, uh, who are contending to be, you know, uh, champions in the space race. Now, yeah. there are private companies as well. Uh, we all know um, SpaceX is out there, and uh, um, there are a number of uh, private investors who are trying to get into space. So. Yeah. Uh, what 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 are your thoughts about the space economy and where is this leading us to? Yes, yeah, so I think that you know I mean, I mean you you described very well what uh, was how we started and all that and then there was kind of a lull for a while and uh, what has happened now and one of the reasons why uh, so many people are getting into it want to get into it is because uh, uh, because of the discovery of water ice on the moon, uh, which was pretty much confirmed about a year ago uh, by NASA scientists. And, and actually, to tell you the truth, it was uh, sort of uh, discovered by Chandrayaan-1 with, uh, they had a moon mineralogy, mineralogy mapper, MMM, M3, uh, that was one of the experiments that NASA put on Chandrayaan-1. And so all of that has galvanized into a lot of interest from many people. So for, you know, for like 40, 50 years, we didn't do anything after that, after going, you know, going to the moon, coming back. Um, because, you know, what for? Why should we do that again? We have done that, you know, been there, done that, of course. Um, uh, some of the other countries you know, wanted to do that, but they were not that interested and excited. Now, something has changed. And what that change is, well, there are a couple of things that have changed. Uh, one of them, of course, is what I mentioned, that uh, there is uh, water ice that they've discovered on the moon. It's 600 million tons worth of water ice. Now, one would say, okay, you know, what's the big deal about water? I mean, we've got plenty of it here. But, uh, but water ice on the moon, and I'll explain that a little bit later. But water ice on the moon is, uh, uh, first of all, it takes, you know, it takes 20,000 dollars a kilogram to take anything from here to the moon surface. So if you have to take uh, water also from here to the moon, that will cost that kind of money. On the other hand, if this water ice can be extracted uh, by entrepreneurs, you know, I mean, I'm hoping Indian American entrepreneurs too, then, uh, then it can be done for about $500 a, a kilogram. So there is a huge amount of um, interest and money to be made also and entrepreneurial things that can be done there. The other thing that has happened that I sort of mentioned is that we have something that SpaceX is doing and Bezos is doing 
when you mentioned uh, other companies and that other company is uh, uh, Blue Origin of Bezos, which is also doing a lot of uh, actually just flew on uh, reusable craft yesterday, the sixth time, same thing, sixth time. So because of that, I mean, imagine if you were to go from here to, you know, to California or something and you get rid of the plane once you get there and they throw the plane away, then uh, what would happen, you know? Then um, it will be um, just a, uh, you know, huge waste and it'll cost a lot of money. But if you were to reuse that thing, which is what we do, then uh, the amount of money will go down a lot. This is what has happened, that uh, Elon Musk has sort of proven uh, beyond a shadow of doubt, effectively. And, um, and Bezos is doing the same thing. And so something is happening, which is, so these two things together makes it much cheaper to be able to go to the moon and, um, and do some of these other things. So what does that do? You know, that builds a whole economy. It builds a space economy, a lunar economy, a space economy, which we were not able to do for all these years which we can do now. And it's just incredibly, incredibly interesting. And, and uh, um, uh, you know, it, it, the more and more things are going to happen. Now, um, why is it important for the water ice there to be found? Because from that water ice, and you're all engineers, you know, that we can make liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen from that. And that's the fuel. Uh, for rockets. So if you were to go there and you are, by the time you reach there, it's empty, then you can take off from there using the propellant from there. And you know that the moon is about uh, 15, 1.5% um, of, the, of the weight mass, of course, 1.2 to 1.5% of the mass of the earth. So the gravitational constant there is about one sixth of what it is here. So to get out of the moon's gravitational well, you require much, much less fuel. And so from there, you can go to Mars, you can go to Jupiter, you can go to Io, you can go to all kinds of places, and asteroids also. So this is a huge, huge deal. And I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, we entrepreneurs and Indian American community and, you know, all of us can really take advantage of that and, you know, uh, delve into it. You know? So that's kind of the idea. De definitely, this is this is a, uh, a as per one analyst est estimates, it's a, a two point seven trillion dollar economy. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be by twenty forty. And uh, when I saw that, I was intrigued. And uh, if if we break it down for um, entrepreneurs and for engineers uh, in the audience here, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there are things that I've seen some folks like Naveen Jain. Uh, trying to do asteroid mining and uh, some others who are, um, you know, planning to do space travel, uh, sell tickets to space in under two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So uh, obviously, all of these contribute towards the space economy. But do you do you really feel that the metal and uh, mineral mining uh, outside of Earth would be profitable for the human race? Well, I'm not so sure of that. And I'm also not uh, uh, particularly, you know, uh, talking about, uh, um, about these kinds of things. And I'm, I'm, I'm going and mining for metal. I, I mean, to me, the economy that we can generate, I mean, imagine this. To do all these things, we would probably have to have a hundred or a thousand people living there. You know, a thousand people thousand Americans, maybe some Indians, you know, we all living there together and, and uh, going from place to place and, and um, of course, extracting even water. Let's just say water ice, extracting water ice. And other, you know, other things that will be done um, would be very exciting to the, to the public here. Um, you know, the moon has lava tubes, which are sometimes lava tubes are underground uh, uh, channels, underground channels or <clears throat> where lava flowed at one time. It would be so exciting to go and, um, 
uh, and, and um, explore those things. You can even put, uh, you know, live stream that thing. And um, I think that people on earth, at least for a <coughs> certain amount of time, would be very interested in, in doing that. This is on, all in addition to making money from just the war rice. And if there is some other uh, metal and there is a precious metal, uh, <coughs> platinum um, uh, called the metal, which are also available. I don't know much about that in terms of how difficult or easy that would be to, to do that. But even without that, we have, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of possibilities of getting people excited about this thing and, and, and a space economy, not only just on the moon, but on the moon, on the cis lunar space, which is the space in between, um, um, around the Earth in Leo, and then from there to go to other places like Mars and other places. So the whole new uh, <clears throat> economy is going to be developed here in uh, well, in the United States, hope, you know, hopefully, uh, we are uh, Americans, and hopefully we'll develop it there, and, and uh, it'll also be developed uh, through other countries, too. You know? uh, I think that. Yeah, great, great. Now, you know, um, we, a lot of us in, as Indians um, have uh, started thinking about space only since the Chandrayaan mission. Um, yeah. Chandrayaan 1 and Chandrayaan 2. And recently, you know, there was a Vikram lander, which uh, was, uh, you know, a topic of discussion. And uh, of course, uh, landing on the far side of moon and discovery of water. So all of this definitely has stirred the imagination of a lot of folks. And mm -hmm. for folks like me, who've grown up watching uh, Star Trek and reruns of Star Trek, uh, mm -hmm. this definitely uh, presents a new way of imagining and uh, I hadn't thought of how we would profit from uh, space and moon and Mars. But then I also heard, uh, you know, a couple of years back, I was moderating a session at Thai, mm -hmm. Thai Con, and uh, um, uh, somebody from NASA, uh, Graham um, uh, McIntosh, yeah. uh, he talked about how uh, big data from their missions and telescopes and all of that is used to fuel various kinds of research, including uh, search for extraterrestrial life, as well as uh, emerging technologies and artificial intelligence and deep learning uh, helps uh, in planning missions for Mars and, uh, you know, even colonize moon. And so obviously it's, it's, it, it stirs up a lot of emotions, uh, but at the same time, knowing that uh, National Aerospace uh, Aeronautical and Space Agency has mm -hmm. always been thinking in terms of 20 years, 30 years ahead and thinking of the humankind as a multi-planetary species. Mm -hmm. And uh, listening to uh, some of the comments from uh, even Elon Musk saying, I want to go and uh, die in, on Mars, but not on impact. So makes a lot of us wonder uh, how, how, how soon can we get there and and especially the economic economic plan that you have the uh the direction that you want uh, us to follow uh, mm -hmm. can you shed some light on that maybe if you have your presentation you want to show yeah, and, yeah. Uh, so let's, uh, let's uh, um go to uh, if you can just uh, can i yeah let's go okay. if you want okay. to control uh, you can start uh, sharing your screen Okay, well, that's fine. You can, you can share yours and I'll just tell you. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, so this is the space, space directive that we have. Let's go to the next one. Uh, and this is where the, uh, and you know, we're going to leave this behind for people to see if they want to. But this is, I'm just going to go through very fast because we don't have a lot of time here. Um, but the green area here is where the water ice is. And the, on, the, on the left, it's a South Pole. And uh, on the right, is the North Pole. Most of the ice water is in the shade area, which is uh, uh, which is uh, which uh, does not um, see any sunlight. So that water has been there for two billion years or three billion years or something like that. Very interesting, uh, but it's still water, <laughs> so we can drink it. So let's go to the next one. Uh, and so uh, NASA has confirmed, like I said. Let's go to the next one. Uh, 
uh, and uh, it, it's been uh, confirmed by some other uh, um, uh, scientists from universities. Next, please. And uh, some other universities here. Next, please. Uh, okay, so here is the, 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 the most important thing that water produced on the moon has a current value of dollar uh, 10 million per ton. And one ton is 1,000 kilograms, which is 10,000 per, per kilogram. But if you were to mine it, it is 5.5 million uh, per ton or $500, kilo, kilo, $500 a kilogram. This is from a mining company in Canada, which has done a very, uh, very good study of uh, what it would take to mine this water and what the costs are right now. So let's go to the next one. Uh, so, okay, I'm going to say something here, which is that I think that many of these countries, including China, are uh, trying to do the same thing. And so it has become sort of an urgency for us, uh, Americans, to do this also. And the thing is that, you know, we are not going to actually, so whoever goes there and who is, who is at the table will write the rules about how we distribute this water ice there. And so <clears throat> if we are not there, we lose. So we are not going to fight. We are not going to go to war over it or anything like that. I'm not saying that. But we have to be prepared. And so we have to be there on the surface as soon as possible. And I'm saying a thousand people there as soon as possible. Next slide, please. Um, so it's, um, it'll be very interesting. Next one, please. So what I'm saying is that now, how do we do this? You know, as we know, uh, I think it is probably a couple of slides below here. So can you just go flip through one more? Yeah, okay. So let's, yeah, no, yeah, back to this. Yeah, Rod, this is the roadmap. So now I'm talking about talking a little technical jargon here. Um, but this is all tied together. This is the, this is the roadmap for all the planets in the solar system about how much energy, or it's called delta V, uh, delta V is velocity, delta V is required to go from here to somewhere. To go from here to the uh, Earth orbit requires about 10 kilometers per second of delta V. And then from there, what, so what we do is we go to the, we go to the low Earth orbit first, then once it's in the orbit, as you know, Chandrayaan-2 did the same thing and many others are doing the same thing. So you go into orbit, you are, you know, sort of going around and around. And then at some time you do trans, uh, you do, you fire your rockets again. It's called translunar injection. So you go and you go straight to the moon. I mean, Chandrayaan-2 did it slightly differently, but uh, Americans have been doing it, going straight to the moon. So you go to the straight to the moon. By the time you reach moon, you're, you know, much less energy, um, kinetic energy. And so you're captured by the moon's gravity. And so you go around in, in the orbit around the moon, which is called low lunar orbit, LLO, and you are captured there. And then you fire a, another retro rocket, and then you slowly <laughs> land, which is what Chandrayaan-2 tried to do also. And so we, then we land. So these are the numbers you see here on, uh, on the right hand top, um, where it says moon, are the numbers that we have. These are, these are the kind of um, energies we need, we need to be able to do this, delta V, in, in terms of energy. So let's go to the next one. So this, this uh, tells you that uh, you will require a certain amount of fuel for being able to go from low Earth orbit to surface of the moon. And that amount of fuel required is called propellant fraction. And the propellant fractions are different for um, for different fuels. RP locks is uh, your kerosene locks, regular thing that SpaceX is using right now. LH2 locks is what, uh, you know, what uh, hydrogen and uh, oxygen, um, which is what has been used also, and what is what uh, Americans will also be using. And actually Bezos is going to use for the upper stage also. Uh, CH4 locks is, uh, is methane locks. So that's, you know, that's Raptor engine that Elon Musk is building and, and uh, also um, uh, Bezos is work, has worked on that already. You know? um, so 
So let's go to the next one. So this uh, are the engines. Next, next one, please. Next one. So what I did was to um, I don't have you know we don't have uh, Bezos new uh, Blue Origin doesn't provide too much information about what they are doing. You know they are doing kind of secretly and stuff. And so I built their own their vehicle in my own code to see what I have a code. We have a code. Astrox is a code called High Side and. We built this in uh, um, in in that, and from that, I can actually design this vehicle, the entire vehicle, also the upper stage of this vehicle, which is what is going to go to the moon. And so I did that. And here you can see um, on the right, uh, Bezos's vehicle, and on the left are my vehicles, the same same size and everything. Let's go to the next one. Next slide, please. Yeah. So this is these are. This is the vehicle that I designed, basically, uh, on the top, and the one below is the Blue Origins, um, the Blue Origins version, uh, Blue Origins vehicles, actually from their uh, payload user's guide. So as you can see, it's very, very close to what they have. So from that, I can tell whether how much, uh, what, what I plan to do, what I'm going to suggest in a minute that we should be doing to get this, so let's go to the next one. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, next one. Uh, so what I'm suggesting is that instead of trying to build a bigger and bigger rocket every time we want to do something, here is what we can do. We put up something in orbit. Say New Glenn puts up something in orbit or Falcon Heavy puts something in orbit. Their upper stage is in orbit. Now it has the first time it carries the payload. I say that let's let's now have another uh, flight of Falcon Heavy or Blue Origin or whatever it is that uh, uh, which is called the New Glenn. And the upper stage now does not have a payload, and so then that upper stage by the time it reaches the same point in low Earth orbit will have that much more fuel left. So then these two things combine together in orbit dock and then what we have is with that we have a lot more fuel and we can use that and and then we do that two or three times by that time but in that way we have enough fuel enough propellant fraction that i showed earlier to be able to go to the moon so now we can do it much cheaper because all these reusable um, vehicles that falcon heavy has falcon heavy is going to cost you know, about $93 million for, uh, for launch. Uh, you can buy that for 93, whereas uh, NASA's uh, space launch system is gonna cost almost one and a half billion dollars for a launch. So this is a lot cheaper to be able to do it this way. And not only that, but that if you do this kind of a thing for, you can, you can uh, make your propellant fraction match with the amount that you require to go to Mars or to go to um, uh, Pluto, uh, not Pluto, but Jupiter or any other, um, any other, uh, um, uh, you know, um, place in the solar system. So this is what you have. You have a roadmap for the entire solar system, which is what I've created here. And it is a lot cheaper. It's five to seven times cheaper than, um, than if you were to go with what, what is at what is there at present, um, expandable vehicles. So these kinds of things just, you know, uh, is, makes it avail possible for us to go to, uh, this is the railroad to the moon with New Glenn. Three flights of that will allow me to take 16 ton of payload to the lunar surface in this thing. Let's go to the next one. Um, now we can do the same thing. I mean, I did the same thing with Falcon Heavy. I designed there upper stage also. Let's go to the next one. <clears throat> so this thing, this picture on the right hand side is what I have designed. This is from high side from my Astrox design, which is, so you, you fly three times or four times or five times and you uh, uh, put the dock, all of these things together. This is a lot cheaper. This is something we can do tomorrow. The whole country, we can, the country can do this tomorrow. Uh, entrepreneurs can do this tomorrow and we can start, you know, building this um, whole 
uh, space economy um, sooner than uh, what uh, NASA is planning to do. And I hope we do that, we can do that, and we do that uh, because we need to be first to do that. So let's go to the next one. And uh, uh, okay, this is the same um, Falcon Heavy here. And next one, please. Uh, these are some numbers for the Falcon Heavy. Next one, please. Uh, okay, so this is, so what I'm saying is that we do, not only we do this, but the tanks of the upper stage of New Glenn and a Falcon Heavy or anything else that we take as an upper stage, they become habitable uh, habitats for people, uh, astronauts or whoever wants to go and stay there uh, for, uh, uh, <coughs> for um, you know, excavations or, of course, you know, all of these things will have to be um, improved and made better and all that, but that can be done. It's not a big, you know, technical problem. This can be done tomorrow, a year from now. Why don't we do that? We should be doing that. And so they, this is a double whammy. We can, we can do it cheaper, plus we can have a triple whammy. We can do it cheaper, we can do it sooner, and we can have these kinds of tanks as habitats available uh, in, uh, to, to be placed on the surface of the moon. Uh, next, one, next one, please. Uh, this is just a picture of the colony where 3D planting, yes. Okay, so I think that this is probably next one. Um, okay, so this is, uh, this is now too much verbiage. So, so this, is, <clears throat> this is kind of uh, what this idea is. And if we want to do a space economy, and if you want to do a space economy for this country or for, for others together, and you know, perhaps uh, United States and India will partner a little bit more and, and all that kind of thing. We can do this together very soon, very fast and much cheaper and sooner. So that's kind of the idea. And all of this is just simply uh, uh, the railroad idea. Well, I mean, we do have, okay. <laughs> I'll get into that uh, when we, uh, when there is some more questions and stuff like that. No. But is that, uh, Piyush, anything else? Yeah, so I think this is, this is great. And I would invite uh, the members of the audience here to oh, yeah. type in their questions via the chat panel. And yeah. uh, there are folks uh, from ACI who are going to be monitoring and I'll be monitoring as well. And then we'll get into audience questions. Uh, but then this, sure. Whatever you uh, presented so far, uh, mm -hmm. in fact, at one stage you said you have redesigned stuff, um, uh, what um, Blue Origin has done, or uh, for that matter, SpaceX or uh, Elon Musk has done. Yes. Uh, but I think what you meant to say was you have simulated the design. Simulated the design, yes. Same, okay. same as what they have. Because if I want to do an actual calculation about what kind of payload I can take to the moon surface, I have to have done that before. Right, right. So okay, so, and, and obviously all of this comes from some kind of experience that you have had in the past working with either uh, US government or uh, aerospace agencies. Uh, and, and can you shed some light on what kind of real work you yourself or your team has done as part of uh, getting up to this stage, getting ready to uh, this new initiative that you are uh, influencing the policy on as well. Yeah, sure. So I have, uh, you know, my company has been around for a while, for 30 years or so, and I've done a lot of contracts for the Air Force and NASA and, um, and uh, uh, you know, DARPA and like that. You know? So I've had, a, you know, a fair amount of experience <laughs> that way. Some of these I cannot talk about, you know, uh, uh, obviously, uh, thing, uh, but uh, yeah, but uh, you know, a lot of a uh, lot of a uh, um, lot of fun, a lot of experience, and a lot of fun too. And uh, you know, I've been you know doing this uh, design of the reusable rockets also. Uh, I designed a reusable rocket for DARPA last uh, about two years ago or something. And so, 
this is kind of uh, um, you know, uh, something that I enjoy doing. And so this, all this work is done <coughs> on my own uh, um, dime, so on my own. So, so essentially what you're saying is you've been investing your sweat equity into this and yeah. uh, uh, now you obviously have some collaborators and you have some uh, technical brains uh, who you have worked with over a period of time uh, yeah. in this space and who are, uh, so so to say, your uh, collaborators or potential partners in the new venture. But more importantly, uh, you had mentioned at one point that you were also very closely aligned with uh, the White House and uh, having some... Um, uh, policy uh, initiatives uh, with them. Are you able to talk about those? Uh, I probably should not. You know, it's, it's, it's just this, that I'm, uh, I, I am, um, uh, you know, I'm interested in uh, letting the uh, people in the know, uh, you know, know about this thing. So what I've done is, you know, I've written a lot of, uh, a lot of articles in, um, news outlets, Space Review, Daily Caller. Uh, I've done some television shows and radio shows on the space uh, um, the radio show. And um, so, you know, I've talked about this for uh, for many years. Yeah. Okay, great, great. Well, I appreciate, uh, you know, and I totally understand uh, there are limits to what you can share in okay. the public forum, so that's yeah. fine. I apologize uh, for that, but, you know, I have uh, to. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Please uh, put it on the chat panel and then we'll put it across. Mm -hmm. Yes. For a second, uh, but I'll hear. Uh, Go ahead. Go ahead with your question. Yes, please. Who is this? I am Dr. Ravi Sharma. Dr. Sharma. I am also a past uh, co-chair of ASCI National and also NCC and Michigan Champ chapters I was on the board so I am connected to ASEI I still get your news and wonderful, uh, wonderful having um, you here. actually I helped set up the California chapters now there are more than one right yes uh, so three in California three in California right first one that started was the Boeing one uh, SoCal Wonderful. So, yes, uh, okay. so I, my question, first of all, Dr. Kothari, I've been hearing you at least for 20 years or 10 years, 10, yeah. 15 years on this subject. And one of the interesting talks he gave where he said about these very uh, fuel fractions, I mean the propellant fractions, uh, in a very interesting combination of rockets at to the scientists at Goddard Space Flight Center. I was present for that talk. So he's a visionary, and we need to thank him for having come out here. I want to interject my own experience of four years on the moon, Dr. Kothari, as I mentioned. Yeah. I worked on the Apollo program, and then on Skylab Space Station and Space Shuttle during 1968 to 72, emphasizing the experiments that the astronauts did on the moon. And mm -hmm. for that, I got the Apollo Achievement Award from NASA. Mm -hmm. um, then we worked on selecting payloads for Skylab. And then I only did design planning for space shuttle and space station up to phase B in NASA mm -hmm. headquarters. Oh, wonderful. Then I returned to India and worked on the ISRO as Space Science Scientific Secretary for four more years or five years. And during that period, we built Earth observation satellites. And also I imparted a lot of training to people like Dr. Ka Mr. Kalam at that time, who then became later a president of India. So. Mm -hmm. There's some thread of continuity. Moon has been my employer, and your emphasis on Moon as a starting point and setting up the colonies were very well described, Doctor. But do you want to tell us a little bit about Mars? And the second point is about the helium. Yeah. Um, 
uh, about uh, about Mars, I would I would suggest Moon is three days away. Mars is six months away. If something yeah. goes wrong, <laughs> yes or not, uh, no doctor is going to make a house call for those people. So, Correct. But uh, but um, I mean they don't make a house call in the same town. <laughs> That's out of question. But Moon at least is three days away, and so some. What we need to do is we need to get real practice here and learn enough that that we feel you know very confident about being able to do things um, in one fourth of a gravity or one sixth of a gravity as in the moon and one fourth as in Mars. So we have to do all that and learn all these things very well first uh, before we before we venture onto Mars. We should go to Mars and, and all that kind of thing. But I think that at this point in time, there is enough potential in, on the moon itself to build a whole economy. So we should be doing that and then other things will just follow afterwards. You know, That's my, that's my opinion on that. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sharma, for your uh, question and Dr. Katari. Uh, let's move on if we have other questions. So I think uh, there is other questions popping up. Uh, please uh, keep uh, typing. Um, um, question from the side. Do you have United uh, of different countries to achieve goal for Moon and Mars on another planet? And do you have blueprint for the above goals like United 22 countries are in line to bring sun energy to Earth. So uh, the, the question is more about, uh, you know, rather than single countries doing things, yeah. do you know much about how the countries are binding together, bonding together to bring sun energy to Earth. And uh, uh, again, another, another thread there is accepting human life is limited. Uh, and um, so I have looked at, uh, I have looked at the, it's called solar space power, okay. uh, um, solar based, solar, solar based so space power, SBSP. I have looked at that. It is really not viable. Um, the problem is that, um, um, you know, you require, it's, it's uh, in, in space, you can capture up to about 12 to 1300 watts per meter square of solar energy. Uh, on Earth, you can capture about 300 to 400 on a good day, uh, you know, watts per meter square. So it's about four times more there. So people say that. But to put up anything in orbit, in this case, it will probably have to be in geo, which is a geosynchronous orbit. It's pretty far and it costs a lot of money to be able to do something like that. Um, it'll have to be a stationary uh, station. Uh, so um, it's just, it's not practical, it's not worth it. And then you have to send that beam all to the earth and then you have to make sure that nothing comes in its way. Um, and then when you calculate that uh, the amount of uh, um, surface area that will be required to get a certain amount of energy from there to here and on earth it'll be four times more surface area that it just you know i mean i would be able to build something on earth probably 100 times larger area at the same price than something in a geo maybe even larger um, ratio so i don't think that solar based solar space power um is really going to pan out. I think there are other things, like what I'm saying about space economy, that uh, have has a better chance of panning out. So I'm. That's what I'm. This is my opinion. Great, thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, Anil uh, Desai, who typed the questions, there were some typos. Obviously, I couldn't understand the question better. But he also has one more question about accepting human life as limited years. And uh, um, obviously, a uh, lot of these programs require time and, um, you know, technical expertise in mm -hmm. making it happen. So 
maybe one of the questions can be formulated is, in our lifetime, can we imagine uh, that we would be able to uh, visit Moon and come back uh, as, as citizens uh, and, and start some profitable venture over there? Uh, absolutely is what I would say you know, as an answer to this. Now, like I said, we can do this. We can start something in a year with uh, what's already available. And they are building some other stuff, but which, which is just what is available, we can start this in a year. In, certainly in our lifetime, we can, in 10 years, we can have colonies of people living there, maybe not a thousand, but we can have a hundred people living there. You know? And so then, then it'll just you know, grow and grow. Uh, <clears throat> space tourism is another thing. I mean, lunar tourism actually is another thing, which is, I think that, I mean, a lot of people, um, I myself, if I had enough money, I would love to go and live there for a, maybe a week or a few days or something like that and come back. <clears throat> I would not want to do that for Mars, even though Elon Musk wants to. I would not want to do that because it will take away about two years out of my life. But for two weeks, oh, I would love to do that. So that's possible. The other question, I think also... Um, uh, that the gentleman asked uh, Mr. Desai about um, countries working together. For space-based solar power, I said no. But for, for going to the moon and for other things like that, space economy, all countries are going to participate and hopefully will participate in that. I mean, China already has some plans, um, well, that, that was disclosed, where they think it's going to be a, a cislunar space, which is a space, space with, between Earth and Moon is uh, going to be ten trillion dollar economy that they would like for that to be. Uh, so, you know, China is going to be there. Uh, India will probably be there. Um, Israel, Russia, European Union, some countries, and and us Americans will all be there too. You know, and so I think that this there is a huge potential here for something completely new, uh, very exciting. Um, and uh, it's just, you know, there's no end in sight after that, that we can go to uh, moon, then we, from there, with this cheaper fuel, uh, um, cheaper ability to go elsewhere, uh, you know, we become a spacefaring civilization, it's humanity, you know. This is, a, this is a thing for the whole humanity. Now, will there be competition between countries? Yeah, I'm sure there will be. But we have to, you know, that there are a lot of competitions on Earth too. So there'll be competition that I don't think we are ever going to war over each other or with other people over this. We'll reach compromises. Actually, um, uh, last year, there was a conference here at the Department of Commerce where United Nations was also invited and, and people talked about what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of rules and regulation we should have for doing something like this uh, a, a week ago or 10 days ago on December 3rd, uh, there was a conference at the US Chamber of Commerce here that I went to where they were talking about the space, uh, lunar and space economy. So this is being taken very seriously. And I think that we should also participate, Indian Americans, uh, which who have contributed a lot to this country and, and, um, and, and various different fields and, and you know, things like that. And I think the here is that, you know, a chance for us also to do this. And there are some real um, good entrepreneurs, uh, strong entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley itself. And those people, they, I mean, you know, these people are coming from there. A lot of these uh, people uh, uh, are coming from that kind of economy uh, and have divulged into this thing. And it's, you can make a you know, mark in history with this. Uh, here is a chance. This is a chance that may or may not come again for, uh, for a long time or for many. Uh, no, you know, there are other, other, other chances that will happen too. But in this field, um, well, not just in this field, but historically speaking also, uh, to have you know, a lunar colony, colony uh, named after you, for example, can also happen, you know, if, uh, if there are some serious entrepreneurs who get into it. So it's just, 
you know, amazing possibilities uh, are there today. So, so what you're saying is uh, as an incentive to the investors, yeah. um, apart from a seat on your, uh, the board of your company, <laughs> they perhaps decide to name a planet or two in the solar system? No, no, no. So colonies on the moon. Okay. okay. On the moon right. village or whatever, something like that, you know. Uh, so, you know, I mean, and these are all various different things that are going to happen. You know, when that will happen and all that is depends on how much, um, um, you know, enthusiasm uh, people are going to it with. And I think that there's real possibility of uh, this is an extraordinary time for uh, for us, for, uh, you know, engineers even. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, when, when you first proposed to talk on this topic, I yeah. thought this was a page taken out of a science fiction movie. But yeah. the more you are talking and the more uh, we've been talking, uh, meeting and uh, preparing for this session, feel, felt like, uh, yes, you've done some work and it really, really needs some backing, um, you know, notwithstanding your uh, alliance with our uh, affiliation with Screen Actors Guild. And by the way, I should tell the audience that uh, Dr. Katari is a versatile and uh, multifaceted personality. He's the first Indian... Uh, American member of uh, the Screen Actors Guild by having, by virtue of having performed in uh, uh, serials and films and uh, so uh, it, it stuck a chord with me because uh, as SAG happens to be a client of mine as well where we are using artificial intelligence and machine learning. You, uh, you are sending residuals to people so, like that. I'm one of those people that you send residual to. <laughs> So uh, I wouldn't, uh, we won't go into the amount of payments or multi-million dollars that you're getting from uh, your films, but let's talk about uh, what uh, amount of money are you looking to raise, uh, Dr. Katari? Well, I, you know, I mean, I'm not, sure. let's, go, let's go to the next slide now, uh, maybe next couple of slides. Yeah, this one. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm not trying to hear... Uh, talk about uh, our team per se or anything like that. I'm just saying that that we have put together a team uh, with me and Jess Parnival, who is a great uh, program manager from DARPA, who actually was the head of the program manager uh, program for uh, a reusable rocket at DARPA. <clears throat> John Livingston is a brilliant guy from Air Force, retired, and Sanjay Puri, the head of US Impact. So, you know, we have sort of uh, gotten together and formed a team like this. So, so that, you know, some people like to see the team. I think, I mean, I, I get excited about what it can, it can be, what, what, uh, what can be for uh, humanity and for America and for us together and all that. And, and uh, so this is the team and the next slide. Um, uh, well, it's a growing market, like what you said, Piyush, it's, it's about 2.7 trillion by 2040, 2040. It might, might even become bigger than that. I don't know. Um, and next. So it's a multi-stage business model um, uh, in terms of the business model, first, second, third, and, and uh, all that. And so these are, these are just some thoughts which uh, we put together. First, you do the proof of concept, of course, obviously. Before actually before that, the zeroth level is uh, a detailed study of what uh, I have discovered here, and then you do the proof of concept, and then construction, expansion, and mature phase. You know. uh, but, but just curious, by any chance, um, you or anybody else has patent on uh, these discoveries? Uh, no, I don't think that um, I have not. I have not applied for anything like that, uh, um, and and um, I don't know. This is this is a process and a method that I have discovered, which is which is a um, good way to go, and so it is something that uh, I had to disclose to the um, public and government, and so it's it's not uh, it's not anything. Um, that can be patentable, per se. I don't. I'm not sure. I have not looked into that. No. You might want to because there are processes and uh, methods that can be patented. Um, 
uh, coming from uh, my IBM background where we used to file a number of patents every year. I have two patents already, uh, um, but for, that is for uh, hypersonic vehicle designs and stuff, uh, where uh, obviously I was able to do that. Awesome. Uh, definitely you have credentials in this space, but let's, let's talk about the money part and uh, how you would, in fact, we are out of time. So in the last minute or so, uh, how would you want uh, the Indian community or the entrepreneurs and the engineers and scientists on this call and those who will be listening to the recording, mm -hmm. how would you want them to be engaged and what's your preferred method of uh, going forward if you could? Well, the preferred method is to um, contact either you or me or whoever else, you know, <laughs> at ASAI or something and then <coughs> we can work together on this, something like this and then we can um, discuss ways to do the proof of concept. Uh, proof of concept can be done with a um, couple of flights of Falcon 9 um, and um, some help from NASA and, and, and like that. You know? And so then other things are a little far away, but uh, you know, for, uh, for uh, the study that we are talking about, that I talked about, um, it's about 600 thousand dollars or seven hundred thousand dollars something of that type proof of concept actually flying um two falcon nines meeting the upper stage in orbit if we can do that that'll be the first time that it would have been done and then those two stages together can take one one ton to the moon surface imagine being able to do that imagine just being able to do that by a company uh, or indian american company let's say being able to do that. Yeah, I think this is a matter of national pride as well as uh, uh, yeah. showing our technical competence. And right. given uh, we heard uh, just you today, but there might be other folks in this uh, Indian diaspora who yeah. may have some experiences uh, and, and uh, you know, banding together is always a good idea. Mm -hmm. Pooling of exactly. ideas. That's a good idea, exactly. Okay. Resources together is a good idea. And right. so, uh, again, if there are any uh, venture capitalists uh, or angel investors in the audience, um, what would be one key takeaway for them? What would be your message for them? I think that the message is that there is not only there is a possibility of uh, um, you know economic benefit, which I the numbers I cited before, uh, but there is also a historic significance, historic contribution here possible for for some people uh, for this has never been done before i mean imagine you being the people um, who will start building colonies on the moon you know? um, uh, i mean this is just absolutely absolutely incredible and then once somebody else starts doing it and then we'll be the second the third but not the first you no know? so <laughs> <laughs> I I just um, got a comment from uh, one of the participants saying this lunar rush, uh, I hope uh, it doesn't make us uh, lunatics. <laughs> well, actually, you know, I was thinking of, uh, I was thinking of founding a company and name it lunatic.com or something like that, but decided not to do that. <laughs> but that's true. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, actually, the word lunatic came from Luna Moon. And that, you know, people used to go crazy on full moon or something like that. That's where the world lunatic comes from. You know? Right. On that light note, I think <laughs> uh, it's time for us to uh, wrap up. I hope you enjoyed the show. And uh, in fact, uh, what I would suggest is uh, for the members who attended, please uh, send your feedback. And if you want to engage with Dr. Kotari, reach out to him, uh, to ACI. Uh, we are here for you. And uh, for those who are not members of ASCI, consider joining one of the chapters and participating in our activities. Thank you very much for joining and uh, good night and uh, all the best in your endeavors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. All. Thank you. Thank you.